Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Hey, everybody. Welcome. We appreciate you being here. Uh, watching you guys on the restream as well. Uh, Susan, already a lot of uh, praise for the After Dark podcast mm -hmm. and stream this week. Yeah, giggles. Uh, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, we have a very interesting guest today. Susan, everything good with you? Yeah, really good. I, I had an organizer come to my house and clean out half of my garage. Now that you're an After Dark star? Doesn't it feel good? Um, I don't really like that stuff. I, I, it was, I was down there for a couple of hours. You don't like being able to walk into the garage? I do like that. I like the aftermath. And, and I was thinking how many years it takes to accumulate and how it's pretty easy to get it done. Two years. It took two years to mess it up again. Remember we cleaned I, it I know, up. but there's stuff in there that's 20, 15, 20 yeah. years we're getting at this time. And, uh, it's nice to see but, the. But yes, I want to answer the question of, I'm excited to be a celebrity. It's been a very exciting week. From After Dark. Yeah, I've had some nice responses. Uh, <laughs> Caleb, what, what was that laugh about? <laughs> <Yeah. doing? laughs> Willie Nelson's granddaughter like texted Beavis, me this little, morning and just, said, uh, great job. That was the best one ever. Yeah. But, but, but Caleb turned into Beavis all of a sudden. When he's going, <laughs> so what's going on? I, I haven't, I haven't what finished there. I haven't finished the whole episode yet, but the parts I've seen are, no. are A plus, five stars. <laughs> astonishing i think astonishing as i threw my way. purse down into the storm drain and, you know. oh yeah that was crazy how we we walked start. into the the day that day it was kind of wild and Annie refused to put his his long skinny arms down there because he it. was convinced that uh the clown was going to come up out of the drain and grab him <laughs> uh, it was a, it was a it was a revealing episode i learned just so say. much about Annie that weekend i really did really well how would you characterize it i i I have a new understanding. So go ahead. I'm listening. How would you? No, I'm not going to ruin it. There's a little. I don't want to make any spoiler alerts for the next show because I'm coming out in another like what four or five weeks. Or yeah, so. she's back again, everybody. In about three weeks, four weeks, and uh, um, it's equally as uh, um, jarring. Let's say so. I suggest <laughs> that you uh, prepare for that one as well. But we do do some stuff with the uh, Booth Boys, and then we get back to yeah, Susan again. Yeah. And I and I think you're coming in again. I've... Like every few weeks, we're going to get her in there. Really. I think I, so. When we left, it sounded like you didn't want me to come back, and then I didn't want too much of it. I felt like if we if we <laughs> if we didn't, um, I don't know if I have much out, left. You know, <laughs> anything overdosed can be a little problematic. That's all oh, I'm saying. Oh. I want them still to be longing for you. That's <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, I I don't have a problem with that. That was a peculiar laugh. But anyway, <laughs> so so I'll bring my guest in today. I'm really interested to talk to Jared Knott. He's the author of Tiny Blunders, Big Disasters, 39 Tiny Mistakes That Changed the World Forever. Uh, Jared is, uh, amongst other things, a decorated infantry officer. But he's written a lot in topics ranging from the Supreme Court reform to Arctic exploration. He's got, he is a polyglot, and I look forward to... Um, uh, Polymath, I guess would be the better way to say that. Polyglot means language. Jared Knott, welcome to the program. It's good to be here. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. So I want to ask, first of all, I, I am, I am. Th this is sort of um, an area of preoccupation for me. And, and, and your way of looking at it, I have not been looking at these things through the prism that your book takes this on. Uh, I just wanted you to, to, I just want to say for myself, I mean, I'm, I'm preoccupied with this stuff. I don't know if you see what I'm holding up. I'm holding up Gustave Le Bon's book, The Crowd. Uh, and, it, this, and he has come under criticism in, in the last several decades. But I revisited this and Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds and a couple other books on, on large trends. And I'm, I'm going to say you ignore this man's observations at our peril. I don't see how you could be living through the present time and not 
see exactly what he was observing uh, playing out in the present moment. I'm not saying it's with the same intensity or we'll have the same outcome, but to, to me, this has never been more salient. So to that point, my, my initial question is, for these small blunders that create such massive repercussions, is that an innate phenomenon of history and or, um, I don't know, I guess you have words, language for this, you know, large scale events. I am thinking about uh, chaos theory and how, you know, for a while there, they said that, you know, butterfly wings in Brazil could affect Arctic storms, you know, this kind of thing. Is it a mathematical phenomenon of large scale human operations or, and this is really my question, I'm sorry it's so long-winded, I, I won't be so much this way the rest of the way, is there something that sets it up? In other words, is it sort of the final element in some, in, a, in a accumulating pressures, phenomenon, movement, something that a, a, a tiny blunder finally sets off the uh, chain event? Yes, well, there is a mathematical uh, element in fact, it was a doctor of Lorenz, uh, who I mentioned in the book, who was actually responsible for coining the phrase the butterfly effect. And the way that began, way back in the 1950s, uh, he, had, uh, he was running a meteorological program. It was a number uh, with a, uh, a decimal and a, a thir uh, like 13, 18, 18 numbers behind the decimal. And it was taking a very long time for the computer to run the, uh, the program, which those numbers are so tiny and so small. If I just lob off about six of them, and say make it a point twelve numbers of point eighteen numbers that will run a lot faster and save me a lot of time. What he did that, and he was amazed what a difference it made in the final outcome. And so the basic lesson there is in a, a progression, you get one up another 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 progression. If you chase something in, in the beginning, it can uh, domino and domino and domino and have a massive different impact uh, down the line. That was the basic uh, essence. And he presented. A paper to a group of mathematicians, and he was saying, "Yes, a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil can set off, can set off a chain reaction that causes a cyclone in Texas a year and a half later," which was something of an overstatement, but that's the basic theme. Well, that can apply to history as well, and uh, as to what about human nature is involved here is just uh, the fallibility of humans. And I, at the end of the book, I talk about uh, Doctor. Uh, I told Wendy. And I won't get into it at this particular moment, but uh, the idea of how to avoid mistakes. And he wrote a, a book that I say in the book has saved more lives and continues to save more lives than any book ever written. And that is the uh, uh, the ch checklist manifesto. Uh, and talking about how the checklist, I won't go into it right now, how the, uh, the use of checklists carefully administered in the operating room has saved many, many thousands of lives and continues to save many more thousands of lives uh, going forward. So it's a part of the human condition, that we're going to make mistakes and we must build into our operational behavior those things which uh, avoid mistakes, prevent mistakes, catch mistakes before it's too late. And that uh, is part of the human uh, condition that all of us are, have to deal with. I, I have a, a couple of questions that's going to take us in a certain direction for a minute. Uh, and so we're going to get off the history train for a second and just talk about these checklists. So... Yes, uh, for sure, operating rooms, uh, uh, flight decks of aircraft, these are areas where checklists are exquisitely important. In, it's interesting, and in, in this is just sort of an intuition I have, in, in my field of medicine, we are hammered into our head internal checklists. Uh, it's, it's called a differential diagnosis, and each differential that we, that we scroll through in our head has a whole series of under of, of categories of checklists and impressions and other things that we um, we automatically scroll through in our head. I mean, I, I think about the series House where people, oh, he figured that out. No, every internist walks in the room with that in their head already. House was doing nothing unusual at all, at all. Routine general medicine. That's what rolls through our head every time we walk in a room. My question is, because so many of the impressions that we develop in each category of those checklists that are going on internally have a kind of intuitive experiential quality to them it's different than surgery different than a than a flight deck 
could we lose something? And it makes me think about bureaucracies and bureaucracies trying to oversee doctors' practice. Don't we lose something when the bureaucracies just throw down checklists? Yes. Yeah, so let me answer the question, starting over with the checklist and coming back this way, so to speak. Uh, you know, yeah. The story is very interesting about uh, Atul Gawande, and he was a surgeon, uh, a very accomplished surgeon, and he was realizing that a lot of mistakes were being made in the operating room. Uh, and he said that the way it was working is that you would get about uh, seven or eight years of experience under your belt. You go into the operating room and you just go by gut instinct and uh, perform the operation from there. But you're human. He pointed out that we all make mistakes and we were having too many situations where lives were lost that could have been saved. So he's wondering, I wonder how, you mentioned the airline industry, I wonder how they handle the situation over with the airlines. They too must deal with very complex situations, with limited time frames. Wonder what they did. So he went and spoke with uh, with Boeing, and his discussion went back to a famous airline crash way back in 1935. It was the uh, uh, forerunner of the uh, Flying Fortress, forerunner of the B-17. I think at the time it was called the B-299. Anyway. It was a crash that took place. It was one of Boeing's very, very best pilots. And, uh, and he and his co-pilot had taken off, and they'd forgotten to turn off the elevator yoke, which is part of the automatic uh, pilot system that forced the nose of the airplane up. The plane stalled. It pancaked down. And both the pilot and the co-pilot uh, were killed. And they, in the accident investigation, well, if they just flipped that one switch, <laughs> the entire thing would have been avoided. So they uh, came up with a system back then of the pilot checklist. There would be 35 or 43 or whatever it was items for them to go through, pilot and co-pilot, turn such and such a dial at such and such position, check, check. Turn off the elevator yoke, check, check, and so on down the list. Now, at one point, talking about the bureaucracy, uh, they uh, went back, I'm finish the story, I come back to that. Uh, so I told Gawande, I uh, took this system back to the medical field and applied it into the operating room. And they discovered, by the way, kind of a sidebar, they discovered that when all of the people in the operating room introduced themselves, gave their name, introduced themselves, that also reduced it for these fatalities because it was better communication within the group. But anyway, they got terrific results. They lowered, the, of course, did a controlled variable study, and they lowered fatalities by an amazing 36%. Well, now it's a uniform throughout the medical industry, throughout the world. We have a checklist system now talking about the bureaucracy. At one point, the bureaucrats came in and said, Well, we like this uh, system so much, we're going to give you a whole bunch more check things, a checklist to put on your item, put in the checklist 75, 80, 90. Whoa, 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 whoa. It, it got, uh, got uh, so bogged down and so inefficient, they had to come back to a leaner and meaner kind of checklist, I think 35, 40, something like that. But it was very, very effective. That can be talking about efficiency and accomplishing your goals. That can apply to building a burnhouse. They can apply to putting a garden together. It can apply to uh, uh, everyday kind of uh, business situations, as well as the very sophisticated and advanced systems of flying and also uh, operations in the, in the operating room. Now, now you bring up the subject, okay, if we follow this mechanical uh, set controlled uh, kind of checklist thing, are we going to be losing something in terms of uh, creativity, in terms of intuition, in terms of insight? And uh, that I don't have the answer for. <laughs> I don't uh, know exactly yeah, what the because answer is. It, no. it, it, it is, I'm watching that happen in real time. That's why I'm bothered by it. And, and it, it's so different than surgery because nobody gets involved with exactly what the surgeon is improvising moment to moment as he or she controls the bleeding, it expands the field, determines. I mean, it's all, it, you know, that what's, what is controlled is, how many sponges, how many pieces of equipment, how much are you using, how much blood is all, I mean, there's so many mechanical, quantitative things. But in terms of controlling what goes on in the clinician mind, that's what they're trying to do. They call those, I brought up the other day here, they call those clinical pathways. And I've noticed that that's what got in the way in COVID, got in the way terribly, where doctors were afraid to do anything that were not handed down by the bureaucrats. And uh, oh, it was, call. it killed, I don't know, killed so many people. Oh my God. <clears throat> so, I mean, I've never seen a time, I've, again, people have heard me say this. I've never seen a time when physicians said, go home and come back when you're really ill. 
I, I, that was just such a shocking, shocking thing for doctors to be telling patients with an illness that, by the way, should be carefully monitored so you can tell if somebody's getting sick so you can jump on it. No, come back when you're short of breath and your uh, oxygen saturation is 88. Well, then I can help you, according to the authorities in charge of my hospital. Anyway, I'm going to leave that be. Let's get let's get back in. Let's get into history. Um, uh, you have very specific... Uh, uh, anecdotes, uh, and if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about a couple of them in the book. Does that work out okay for you? Yes, sir, please. Yes. Sir. All right, tell us about the single document that was poorly designed by one clerk in one country that changed the outcome of a presidential election and led to more serious problems. Yes, that uh, is a fascinating story, and it, it really stings. It kind of, it's a uh, painful thing to go through, but it had to do with the election, presidential election, back in uh, 2000 down in Florida. Now, it's not the hanging chads, which got a huge amount of publicity. It's something else uh, altogether. And it was uh, the clerk down there in Palm Beach County. She had a lot of uh, older people there, and she wanted to design a ballot that was with larger print so the uh, older people would uh, not be confused and confused easily. And easily. And so what she did was design it's a butterfly ballot, in different context of the word butterfly, and it was a list of candidates' names on the left page and a list on the right page with a series of punch holes down the center. Well, Al Gore's name was the number two uh, name on the left page, but he was the number three punch hole. The number two punch hole belonged to Pat Buchanan on the right page. Well, in the surrounding counties, Pat Buchanan got maybe 100, 150 votes uh, per county. This one county gets like three, 4,000 votes, and some people got confused and mm. punched uh, Buchanan's name, and they put Al Gore's name, and they would double punch those. There were 5,000 ballots that were thrown out as being invalid. Uh, Al Gore ended up uh, losing the state by like 456 votes. He would clearly, clearly, what Pat Buchanan himself said, that there was confusion on the part of the voters, and thousands of votes should have gone to Al Gore. Al Gore would have uh, won the state. He would have won the presidency, and he was adamantly, adamantly opposed to the war in Iraq. Now, I think... Uh, Stepping into a little bit of a controversial area here, but I think both Republicans and Democrats look back these 20 years later and realize that the war was a major mistake. The 9 11 Commission said it was an example of groupthink. But we uh, had the nice lady, yeah. say her name, nice intelligent lady, they had her on uh, um, morning television, they were interviewing her, and they were saying to her, People are saying that you're responsible for this war. And she was in tears, crying, and so on and so forth. Well, madam, we appreciate the fact that you're crying, understandably. But we have 50,000 dead people and $2 trillion down the drain, all because of a single tiny mistake. Yeah, it's uh, it's back to this, right? It's this, this is this is what this is what I'm obsessing about these days is this tendency to groupthink. How, how do you how do you understand that groupthink phenomenon? What do you make of all yes. that? Yes. Yeah, I had groupthink. Uh, and by the way, that was the decision to go to war was groupthink. Her particular decision was in a little bit different category, but talking about groupthink, it has a lot to do with authoritarianism, it has a lot to do with pleasing your boss, it has a lot to do with not being embarrassed in front of the group. So uh, the basic definition is, as you know better than I, an idea comes down from on high. Well, everybody wants to curry the favor of their superiors, no one wants to be the hammer that the nail sticks up and gets hammered down. So the strong tendency for everybody to be yes men to some extent, uh, yes, JB, great idea, I think it's terrific, uh, it'll work. And uh, well, it, uh, and so it's, it's a, and, uh, we have a very intelligent uh, group here. I hope I'm not getting boring here, but there's uh, the old thing, it's uh, dialect, the dialect, see, dialectic materialism anyway. There's the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Here's a new idea that comes out, and people will take the idea, they disagree to some extent, they make suggestions to improve it to some extent, and back and forth, and then ends up with a synthesis of the original idea plus suggestions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if people don't want to displease their boss, they won't come up with too many antithesis ideas. They will come up with that, gee, I think that's great, uh, a little bit of brown nosing, a little bit of being a sycophant to some extent. And they've been, some of the worst mistakes in history have been ideas that came down from on high, that were not challenged, that were not improved, they were implemented by trying to please their boss, and they ended up being disaster. The uh, decision, um, the decision to go to war against Iraq was a 
was a mistake. And it was, uh, it was went through unchallenged and important to the 9 11 Commission. It was an example of groupthink, which happens uh, uh, in many different categories and many different contexts. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. I, I you know, people that listen to my stream, I, I, he, what, uh, what John is talking about is, um, Jared rather is talking about, is the thing I call Hegelianism. So it's phenom phenomenology, which is, uh, as you said, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Uh, Hegel was, the, I, although Hegel didn't come up with exactly that construct uh, or, or dialectical materialism, he alluded to it. And he's sort of given the uh, responsibility for these, these ideas, although it's not really what he was talking about so much. Uh, and I, I, you know, as we head towards excesses on all sides these days, uh, which I see everywhere, uh, I keep hoping, I, I keep waiting for the synthesis. I keep hoping for the synthesis. It, it, do you feel, and, and is, you know, and anyone sort of familiar with, uh, again, the madness of crowds, Oh, they always say that uh, things are changing and getting better before you're aware of it. Do you think we're moving towards that synthetic process? Well, yes. I, I, in my book, I, I tried not to be political. I tried to be uh, perpendicular and, and non-political, uh, but I'll kind of step over the line just a little bit. I think in, uh, in some cases, we uh, went too far. The pendulum swung too far in one direction. And it was clear that it did not work very well. And so the pendulum is swinging back as sort of like the antithesis, I guess, to the original ideas. In some cases, the question of outright rejection of the original idea. In some cases, the question of uh, just improving and modifying the original idea. But I am um, optimistic. I hope I'm not being naive, but I am optimistic that we are swinging back in the right direction. Since we got the burn a little bit by going too far in the wrong direction. Right. I, that, that's my hope. I, I just, I've been hoping for a while. <laughs> I just don't see, I, I, it seems like it's calming down a bit these days. Uh, back to the uh, group think, uh, you know, this idea has been put out there about a, essentially a mass delusional kind of syndrome. And, and, you know, yes or no, I mean, you know, humans are always prone to kinds of distortions. I mean, that's just the way our brain is configured. Uh, whether or not we're in some accelerated version of that, people can argue. Um, but I found it interesting, getting back to Le Bon again, Le Bon, uh, he talked about these being sort of hypnotic states. Uh, do you have any opinion about that? Um, I guess, I wouldn't put it, from my perspective, I'm not uh, in this field, I'm just a layperson in that uh, field of uh, psychology, but... Um, I think it is, uh, we are influenced by our peers to a large extent, and I'll speak frankly, we're also influenced by the uh, news media to a large extent. And so these influences of our peers, also our news media and our leaders can lead us in a direction that sometimes is correct and sometimes is not correct. And if we get over in that zone and we find that it's not working very well, then we get, there's a, an embarrassment, there's a confrontation, there's a, a, a sting, slap on the wrist or slap on the teeth and we start to swing back the other direction and our leaders start to realize they made mistakes and they take us another direction and there's also in the democracy of course there's a strong temptation for leaders to be demagogues to say those things and do those things which will inflame the public inflame the voter and win them votes but may not be good for the voter it may not be good for the country long term that kind of uh, demagoguing of course is uh, probably the Biggest weakness within a democracy, uh, but I, uh, it, uh, demagogues will be proven wrong, and we, voters will hopefully learn the lesson, and then they will uh, choose leaders that are wiser and move in a more um, wise direction. That is my uh, hope, and I hope I'm not being naive. Uh, yeah, interesting. We, uh, no, I, I, I hope you're right. I, I, I think, and I think the sting to the voter is cognitive dissonance people don't like the feeling of cognitive dissonance and so that, that's what moves them off a certain position that that, that is they, they don't the the leaders have a real consequence they get voted out of office or whatever people withdraw their support but the average person just gets that unpleasant sting of of cognitive dissonance that kind of moves them 
How about the soldier that kicked the helmet off the top of a wall and caused an empire collapse? Explain that one to me. Yes, I know. It seemed like it's impossible. What in the hell are we talking about? A helmet that caused it. Yeah, exactly. But uh, here's what happened. It had to do with one of my favorite characters in history. It was also mentioned in the Bible. That's Cyrus the Great. And his tomb, he was one of the first world conquerors. And he established the Persian Empire. And his tomb, which is now called Iran, is still there over 2,000 years later. These are the words of his tomb. He said, O traveler who comes to visit me, and I know you will come, for I am the one who gave the Persians their empire. Do not begrudge me the small amount of dirt that I placed over my bones. <laughs> but anyway, he was uh, going to war with uh, Cyrus, I'm sorry, with Croesus, uh, from the expression of richest Croesus. And Croesus had gone to the Oracle of Delphi and splashed a bunch of gold around, a bunch of money around, trying to get a favorable prediction, a prediction from the uh, Oracle as to how the big battle was going to turn out. And that Oracle said, a great battle will be fought, and a great victory will be won. And Croesus, I guess he figured with all this goal, surely he means that I'm going to win. Anyway, that was not exactly the way it turned out. So anyway, the battle is joined. Uh, it, uh, Croesus is the emperor of uh, Lydia, and he's in this big impregnable fortress called Sardis. So the battle is engaged, okay, and then it's uh, basically a draw. Uh, Cyrus the Great takes his troops, puts them on his ships, and sails away and leaves. Well, they, Spartans who were on the side of, uh, of uh, Croesus, okay, we won the battle, they pack up and they leave and they go back to Sparta. But they did not call him Cyrus the Great for nothing. Six or seven days later, he turns around and comes back. Okay, now the Spartans are not there and the battle is once again engaged. Well, Croesus, of course, has sent word to the Spartans, hey, they've come back, please come back and help me. Winter is coming, it's not clear who's going to win the battle, who's going to lose the battle. And here's came the tiny mistake. A soldier up on top of the wall, it's a big sheer cliff uh, on one side of the fortress, uh, and it does not, it, you know, man all troops there because they think it's impregnable. And they, he actually kicks the helmet off the top of the wall, it falls all the way, all the way, all the way down to the bottom. The soldier gets off the wall and walks in a footpath all the way down to the bottom, gets his helmet, goes back up the wall, goes over the top of the wall. Well, one of uh, Cyrus the Great's men that sees him, hey, look, 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 there's a pathway on the side of the wall. And the next night, a raiding party goes up that same pathway over the top of the wall, goes over to the gates, forces the gates open. Cyrus the Great's men are there waiting. They come flooding into the city, and they conquer Lydia, and they conquer Croesus. Uh, so, uh, and they, if we hadn't been for that tiny mistake, it's possible instead of being called Cyrus the Great, he might have been called Cyrus the Chump. We don't know what would have happened. But anyway, a wise leader who gave, by the way, he's the one that the Bible talks about. He's the one who gave the children of Israel their freedom from Babylon. And so he's very favorably mentioned in the Bible and a very wise and strong leader. Depends whose who's side of uh, the table you're or the fortress wall you're on, I suppose. But that's really interesting. Right. That, that, uh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I, I, have, I want more. Um, let's see. Uh, mechanical device a few inches long fails to function, which changes the outcome of World War II. How does yes. that work? I can I imagine there's yes. lots of little things like that. Why, why did one get your attention? It was very, very pivotal, and it involves another favorite character of mine in history, uh, a man who was uh, Henny von Tresco, and he was a uh, German high-ranking general who was, uh, had a high position on the Eastern Front. He was part of the uh, group of generals who were attempting to assassinate Hitler. And at one point, they were just about to give up because everything they tried had failed. Hitler, by the way, uh, evil man that he was, was very shrewd. And he observed that uh, assassins were successful so often because they knew where the target was going to be at a particular time and a particular place. So he made a point of having a very erratic schedule. He'd be supposed to be for a meeting. He wouldn't show up for the meeting. He'd be talking with some people for 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to leave for a few minutes and come back. He'd leave, never come back. They never knew where he was going to be at any one time, at any one place. So they're about to give up. And a message came from Henning von Kreskow from the Russian front. He was saying that it is almost certain that we will fail. But we should continue the attempts to assassinate Hitler so that the people of the world will know and people of future generations will know that there were men inside Germany willing to lay down their lives to oppose Hitler and the evil he represented. He is not only the arch enemy mm -hmm. of Germany, he is the arch enemy of the world. So anyway, here's what happened. They uh, lured Hitler to come 
to Russia for a big meeting to review all the strategy that was going on with the war against the Russians. And it was really kind of a ruse. And then they, uh, a ruse, they uh, had a box, it was a gift box, supposedly, that had a bottle of liquor in it. And they put it on the plane, please take this to General So-and-so back in Berlin. But it wasn't a bottle of liquor, it was a bottle. And just before they put it on the plane, they pulled the trigger, a tiny little device, a triggering device that's about like three and a half inches long, the acid, uh, one part is supposed to eat through, and then cause it to trigger, cause the bomb to go off. They put it on the plane, a hitler's plane flies off, going back to Berlin. It's supposed to blow up about 45 minutes later. You can imagine the tension of them walking around, you know, waiting to hear, waiting to hear. Well, two and a half, three hours later, it was playing at, at lands without incident. And then are they going to be in big trouble if somebody opens up the box, they see that it's a bomb and not a bottle of liquor. So, but they are able to get back, get their hands on the, the bomb, they open it up, and it was a tiny little device that failed to function. And it had gone, gone off, blown up. The World War II would have ended a year earlier. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people, would have, their lives would have been saved. The map of Europe would have been very different. Eastern Germany would still remain part of Germany. Poland would have been still uh, part of Poland, uh, communist uh, Russia would not have been able to dominate so much of the continent. It would have been a, a different outcome, but uh, it was not to be. I, I'm almost as intrigued by how they were able to get from Russia to Berlin to get the bomb. I mean, they didn't have text messaging, you know, they didn't have cell. I mean, what, and by the way, even the idea that, you know, ha, what you, what you quoted the general as having said, was that in some sort of encrypted letter or something? How, how do we still well, have he, that, that he, that he made that statement? He was able to get messages back and forth. He was, again, a high-ranking, very high-ranking general himself. And he was communicating with other generals. So they had a means of communication. And that, uh, that message was, uh, oh, was, it was saved as part of, uh, part of history. He got a man of uh, courage and character, and, uh, but he was just anticipated they were not successful. And again, how they got to Berlin and got the, uh, the bomb that, <laughs> I mean, it's they were just, that ranking. sounds like a movie. Well, they were, no, no actually, well, it was in the movie. Valkyrie about made about 15 years ago with Tom Cruise. But anyway, yeah. of course, the high ranking generals, they would have opportunities to fly back to Berlin for meetings with the high general staff, et cetera, et cetera. So when I was able to make an excuse, come back and they go, go to that bottle of liquor that you have it here and it's over here someplace. And that, well, oh, yeah, the bottle of liquor you want, the general was giving to him. Why don't we open it up and drink it now? No, no, no. <laughs> so anyway, they're able to get it back, fortunately, and no one else opened it and realized what it was. Wow, crazy. Do you, do you have a, a general theory on uh, history that you operate from? I mean, I mean you, you've mentioned several times the, the shortcomings of humans. Is, is there some general theory that, that you could sort of help, help us understand? Even, I, of course, I'm always trying to understand the present moment. So ultimately, I'm looking for that. But I, I, that may be asking a lot. Yes, it, um, I guess it's a recognition of the human condition. If we get things right 88% of the time, 85% of the time, 93% of the time, something like that, 95, you're doing very, very well. Uh, built into our analysis and makeup uh, must be an awareness that there is a natural tendency for mistakes to take place and that you must be on guard against that weakness within human nature or it will bite you in the nose. Uh, at the beginning of the book, I talk about uh, a gentleman named uh, Kleiss, uh, Dusty Kleiss, and he was uh, getting ready to use a naval uh, dive bomber. And this is just before the Battle of Midway, but every time he went into the plane, there was this checklist, speaking of checklist again, that he would go through. He would make sure that he had uh, two uh, little cloths to wipe off the uh, condensation and also to wipe off the plastic on his charts. He had like two pencils. He had uh, uh, a certain kind of advising that he would use on his lips. He also had uh, a couple of uh, injections that would uh, give energy if he got wounded and someone like that. He had this uh, checklist, he had his helmet, so on and so forth. So uh, just like the Boy Scouts, a big emphasis on be prepared. Uh, that should sort of be taught to people, ingrained in people. There's a certain percentage of the time, 10, 15, 20, 50 percent of the time, is going to be a painful mistake unless it's prevented and intercepted before it takes place. So the big emphasis on careful preparation, being well thought in advance will make you much more efficient. Now, and, and avoid a lot of negative results. Now, uh, there's an old expression like nothing like success, 
Well, if you have more success, you're going to feel happier, more cheerful, and better adjusted. And so it's going to pay, pay dividends in terms of your psychological uh, makeup. So my orientation, I guess, to answer your question is from a, coming from a practical standpoint. I will also mention, I'm a big follower of, uh, in the seminars of Tony Robbins, and he talks a lot about core beliefs. Now, your core beliefs are very, very important. That's not in the book, it's a different subject. But if you have a negative core belief, life is the pits, and then we die, you tend to have, you know, behavior tends to follow that, you tend to have uh, results that are not very fulfilling. If you have uh, positive core beliefs, I know I'm not necessarily endorsing all that he's done, but Bill Clinton had a very positive core belief. Uh, you can sometimes win by never quitting. And the comeback kid who would keep trying and trying and trying and always managed to be successful by never giving up. George Bush, the father, had a good, basic, simple core belief good things happen to good people. And so if you are a good person and you are uh, doing uh, those things that you're supposed to do and helping other people and supporting other people, good things will come back to you. I would consider that a positive core belief. Now, Hitler uh, had expressed, some people sometimes express their core beliefs. He had the core belief that the world belongs to the brave. Well, okay, but well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, I mean, yeah. but he, that's, that's the way he thought. Uh, about he thought like a street fighter and so on and so forth. And no matter how many people were hurt, how many people were killed, so on and so forth, the world belongs to, to the brave. But uh, fortunately, that's not always the case. It belongs to the just and uh, and well supported uh, more than uh, the people who are thugs, for the most part. I I like that frame that, that brave, just, and then more simply good. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me again that that this. Um, mindset or core beliefs you're talking about uh, is again flirting with this very similar to the hypnotic sort of literature uh, on the idea of intentions you know you set your intentions and you act accordingly uh, and it's different than i'm a lovable person i'm a good person as people love me people love me that's Stuart smalley you know what i mean if you remember that skit from saturday night live a million years ago as opposed to intentionalities or yeah, intentionality around core beliefs, which is more about action and experience. And uh, I think people miss that distinction sometimes. They they feel like, well, if I think positively and I think I'm a good person, yeah, yeah, that helps. And gratitude helps and faith helps. All these things help. But you got to have, you got to set your intention and do it. <laughs> there has to be action attached. Uh, and yes, you have to experience feedback from the world. Yes, and that connection, of course, uh, Goal setting, as, uh, as you know, uh, once you set a goal, you make a commitment, and also write down your reason as to why you want this to happen. What, what strong feeling do you have if it does happen, if it does come through? Uh, and then there's just this motivation that comes behind that, and if that power and that focus and that uh, idea that this is where we're going to take all these the energies that we have, we're going to focus it uh, towards this one pathway to get this one result. That didn't. Of course, being a good uh, person too it doesn't hurt, but that is um, right. putting your, your your abilities and your powers uh, and uh, your and your intentions uh, uh, and uh, set in a particular target. And uh, many times you can achieve the target that just from that alone. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. I think I think that's really a good message. I don't I don't talk about that kind of thing enough, uh, and it's it's just sort of. Um, Anyone that's around those ideas sees them working. I, I don't know that I can, you know, quote double-blind placebo-controlled studies that show us this, but it it's certainly something that I find to be true. Is that something you live by? Uh, yes, uh, not I'm saying not saying I live by it perfectly, but there's the in that connection. So uh, quotation about uh, persistence being so extremely important. I mean, one of my favorite quotes are from uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, Never give in, never give in, never give in, never, never, never. Well, or sometimes you better give in. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of, uh, you got to get your uh, yeah. you got. Sometimes you obviously you have to accommodate and you have to adjust. But the idea of uh, you have set out to accomplish something, it's very important to you. You make a major effort. You uh, show great tenacity towards accomplishing it. You will get there. And then that does an awful lot of things for your self-esteem, for your well-adjustment. A lot of positive things yeah. that can uh, come out of that. No, you're right. It builds on itself. But what what I'm finding fascinating is, as I think about this with you, 
is that this has many different frames, but it's really the same phenomena, which is, uh, you know, Warren Buffett says, don't lose money, don't lose money, don't lose money, <laughs> never lose money, never lose money, never lose money. That That's his frame, but it's still the same thing. And then there are um, sort of leaderships and psychological coaches that just say, uh, there's no such thing as failure. Failure is an opportunity. It's a learning experience. You just move on. You you, you push push past or adjust course once you've had your lesson in failure. Uh, but it's not something that should stop your movement. It's just a, a lesson. Uh, and, well, and that's that's all the same stuff. And it has nuances on it, of course, because some some failures can be devastation. I mean, they can be. But go ahead. You were going to say. Yes. Now, uh, one thing, another thing from Tony Robbins is that everything we do in life is done for one of two things, uh, to either avoid pain or to seek pleasure. And of the two of those, avoiding pain is the more powerful. We'll do a lot more to avoid pain than we will to seek pleasure. We'll work much harder to keep from getting fired, keep from getting an F in a course than we will to get to go from a B to an A. So that, that pain can be a powerful uh, motivator. And you hate to say it, but of the two, of course, it is the far more powerful motivator. And it ties into something that, um, that's a, I call it kind of a fancy phrase, I guess, but uh, uh, reaction formation and that lyrian overcompensation. And what is that? That is when you have a painful experience of one in the spectrum, you flunk a test. Whoa, that's never going to happen to me again. And that pain is a great motivator. You study very hard, you study very hard. Yeah. And the next test, you do much, much better. One of the best examples of that is uh, the Roman Empire. And way back when, the Celts overran Rome, uh, and they woke me into the vanquished. And the only reason that they left was that they got dysentery there in Rome. I guess they weren't washing the pots well enough, and they chose to leave for that reason. But they totally conquered uh, the Romans altogether. Well, it took a number of years, about 130 years, but the Romans, well, this is not going to happen to us again. And so they built up their armies more and more and more, and got to the point where, gee, not only can we defend ourselves, now we can conquer the village next to us, we can conquer the city next to us, we can conquer all of uh, uh, Italy, we can conquer Gaul, we can et cetera, et cetera, like that, Greece and so on like that. And so the Roman Empire threw it out of the humiliation uh, and defeat uh, at the hands of the Celts. Now, of course, it's a, is that a moral question. Is it, a, is it a good thing we had the Roman Empire? Well, yes, no, yes. Of course, they crucified thousands of people. They, they, they were very barbaric, et cetera, like that. But it, it is a lesson in human nature that that great strength came out of a great defeat and humiliation. And that, um, that's one thing that people can learn. You, you take that pain and you use that as motivation to compensate, make yourself much stronger than you ever have been, and much better off than if the defeat and the setback had never taken place in the first place. Yep, I, I agree with all this, but I, I'm just becoming increasingly fascinated with all the different versions of the same thing you, you mentioned avoiding pain seeking pleasure uh the some of the uh behaviorists think in terms of fear and reproductive instinct <laughs> that those are the, mm -hmm. the the fear of destruction and pain reproduction is pursuit of of pleasure and the other thing is our brain is set up in such a way that negative saliency is much more powerful to us and if you think of it just in simple terms, and this is not an exactly a great analogy, but I mean, it, your, your brain is going to make far more of seeing uh, a leopard move in a tree than uh, a, a butterfly in that same tree. You, you, the, the danger has much more powerful salience. And particularly if that leopard gets a hold of you or, you know, it, 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 nothing else, you know, matters. It, it, your, your 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 entire existence is able to be focused on those negative salient phenomena, while the pursuit of pleasure can be um, it's a little more generalized than so deeply focused. Well, listen, it has been a privilege to talk to you. I, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to let you go. Uh, the book is a. I'm saying no. You're right. Hang on, not just yet. Okay, the pursuit of pleasure is not usually life threatening, uh, whereas the painful experiences. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the book is off, uh, Tiny Blunders, Big Disasters. Uh, you can go to, there's the full screen of that. You can go to tinyblundersbigdisasters.com. I'm sure it's available Amazon and other places. Am I right on that, Jared? 
That is correct. Yeah, Tiny Blunders, BigDisasters.com. We have a website there. It has the uh, book trailer there. It has two and a half uh, free chapters. We have a special this week. You get the electronic download for a right. dollar and 99 cents. So and it's a website's a lot of fun. Great. Is, do you have your own website or any other place in social media you want to refer people? Yes, that's the one right there. Tiny Blunders, BigDisasters.com. And okay. again, we have the book right yeah. there. We have a, my favorite part of the book is the corporate gallery there. It's uh, fun to go through each of the different things, 28 different people there, uh, some good, some bad, and read about the individual. You go from there directly to the chapter that uh, relates to them. Right. Uh, in addition to the two and a half three chapter, so it's designed to be a fun right. place. Beautiful. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us. And uh, everyone, go get the book right now. It sounds like something you will. Uh, it's, it's a great, I always like history that has a, a road in, that has a point of view. And so you learn the, the historical sweep through a particular narrative. And I always enjoy that. So, uh, congratulations and thank you for spending time with us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. It was an honor to be here. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Take care. Uh, now we're going to take a little break. Uh, when we get back, I have, let me, I hope Keith, I hope you're still there on hold. I know you've been waiting a while. We are going to get an update on Keith's story on monoclonal antibodies and Paxlovid. He's done a deep dive, and there is quite a story to be told there. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw. Uh, Caleb, do you have Dana White yesterday talking about this? Uh, I think I can send it to you. If uh, Do you have that on hand? I think I, I sent it to you yesterday. I don't think I have it. Send it to I'll me. I'll send it to you. Yeah. I'll, I'll text it to you. No, it, email it to him. Email, email it to you. Okay. It, it's an extraordinary, I mean, his his comments were so spot on. I was uh, I, I was fascinated. I was sort of stunned and fascinated. But let's take a quick break. Be right back. Let's talk about our friends at Hydrolyte. I can't say enough about Hydrolyte. You hear me talk about them all the time. It gets me through workouts and medical procedures and colonoscopies and COVID. It absolutely contributed to my recovery from COVID. Hydration is key to feeling healthy, and there's never been a time when that could be more important. We're in the height of cold flu season. Every headache has got you testing for COVID. Staying hydrated can keep the questionable symptoms at bay, and there's nothing better than Hydrolyte to get it done. Taking their hydration formula one step further, now there is Hydrolyte Plus Immunity. It starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients. Plus, each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water to make a great-tasting drink that is a 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all-natural flavors. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. That is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash Dr. Drew. And be sure to use that code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. All right, I'm back, but I guess the uh, clubhouse hung up, which is unfortunate. So I'm going to go to start a room start again. Start a new room, yeah. Uh, let's go. Sorry about that. It was Keith <laughs> I wanted to talk to who had his How hand up. How hung was, up? That's weird. I guess when you make a phone call, it, it hangs up on you. Uh, so well, sorry about we that. we know that. But uh, I am going, some things are driving me in. Use a house phone next time. Somebody says, how about having Duncan Trussell on? How about we have Duncan Trussell on? It's been a while. Yeah, He's, be good. You have gonna, to text him. Didn't, I'm gonna, you in touch Pauline with? and I are going to be on his show next week. Mm. Uh, we're going to be on next Monday. So, so we'll, we'll get on. them back here. Yes, indeed. Um, and we're going to have Pauline on here too. Yes, that'll be good. Maybe we should come down to Laguna. Uh, let's see. I guess the mic wasn't muted, everybody, when I made my call. Is that correct? Which is now a violation of uh, HIPAA. Is that true? What's that? I guess they were I hearing couldn't hear my it on call. The no, I couldn't hear were. it on the stream, but it might have no. been on Clubhouse. So just delete the Clubhouse. No, because Clubhouse hung up. No, as I had it muted. I... Okay, good. Uh, great. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, the mic was muted. They're saying now somebody was, I'm waiting for, uh, just being a dick. I'm waiting for Keith to come back. Don't be a dick. Uh, Keith had difficulty getting Get me in trouble for nothing. Monoclonal antibodies for, um, uh, for his, uh, I believe it was his mother-in-law. And he also had ran headlong into the, the problem with Paxlovid and lo and behold, you cannot get these medication. And this is something that's new in the recent weeks. Uh, it, it was always quite available. If you remember back when I had COVID a year ago, 
I started by saying, look, you got to just go get the monoclonal antibody as soon as you get sick. If there's any question at all, if you're in a risk category, get them, get them, get them. If you're you know, 22 years old, you probably don't need them. But if you're desaturating, your uh, PO2 is dropping down, get them. They work. They're like crazy. And the first reaction I got was, oh, it's because you can get them. You can afford it. Free, free, free. The government bought them. They were available to everybody. And doctors were not recommending them. Now, finally, they've started being widely used. Now they can't distribute them and won't distribute them. The uh, Sotovramab is the only one that really works against Omicron, but plenty of people still have Delta and they've been unable to get it. Now, what I want to play for you is uh, a quote, or something Dana White said in an interview. There's a lot of F-bombs in this, Caleb. Is that going to get us in trouble with uh, Clubhouse? Uh, Say it's what? I, I think it's, it's the internet, so everybody's fine with it. No. Okay, There's so can you, can you play time. this? Are we allowed to play it? Um, so was it, so I didn't actually get to watch the clip. I just saw what you sent me. So is this an actual, this is, this is a press conference. It's an interview. Okay. So then this should be fine. He did. If, and he as long as there's not any mind. wrestling clips at all, they always get for wrestling clips, but I think this should be fine. No, I, what I would like to, I, I'll, I'll stop it. I, I don't want to run the whole thing. We'll, we'll just do part of it, but go ahead right. and let's um, roll it. And I'll tell you when to stop. I was wondering what your thoughts were with the 200 plus doctors trying to put pressure on Spotify saying that Joe's a menace to... Are they really? Yeah. Well, how about this? Ever since I came out and said what I did, it's almost impossible now to get monoclonal antibodies. They're like, they're, 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 they're making it so you can't get them. You know, medicine that absolutely works, they're keeping from us. I don't want to get too political and start getting into all this shit, but... Ivermectin and, and monoclonal antibodies have been around for a long time. Now, all of a sudden, you can't, you can't dig them up to save your life. The doctors won't give them to you. you know? And even when I did it, when I did it h h here in Vegas, which was however many weeks ago that I had it, like right before Christmas, I think, or something, yeah, I made one phone call and was able to get, to get it done. And that's not like some fucking rich, famous guy shit. Like anybody could have called and, and, you know, because that's what everybody always throws at me. Yeah, of course you can fucking make a phone call and get it. Bullshit. Everybody could have got it back then. Um, you know, Lene had it. Lene did monoclonal antibodies and di did all that stuff. Everybody could get it. Now, I, you know, Rogan's been talking about it. Then I went crazy talking about it. You can't get those things to save your life now. Literally. at that let's you, we'll stop it there uh, so that was just my I'm point here's, worried, here's and he said i'm much more worried what? about him using the i word than the f word <laughs> right 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 right, right. And, and, that's and, okay and that I, we have I, three strikes coming I, in here. The, the fact that these guys keep and let, and let me be critical of that that they keep throwing the the, the i in with the monoclonal antibodies really inappropriate the, the monoclonal yeah. antibodies the packs of it these are things that Focus measurably really seriously work and they make the whole I thing just not even relevant of conversation. But he goes on to say it, it, that he's astonished and he couldn't believe it. It's like nothing he's ever seen yeah. before. And they, I thought that's how I feel all the time. It's just amazing to see Danny White seeing that. But Keith, you went headlong into all this. And thanks for calling back. I did. You, you rule. You, um, <laughs> you live. You live. So yeah. uh, day four. So to recap, uh, I'm sorry, I somehow got bumped off of Clubhouse. No, but no. Everybody did. Um, I had to make an emergency call and it bumped everybody off. So <laughs> gotcha. So mother-in-law, day three, she had COVID symptoms, had a positive test at home, had sent a message to her phys physician, and we were waiting on a response. That was this past Thursday. <laughs> so Friday morning, she finally got a response. It was the response that you hate so much, basically uh keep up the good work stay home and if, it, if you have trouble breathing uh then do something right if you get really uh, sick just, we'll call you it's crazy yeah so i door busted the the clinic in the morning 7 45 i was there i said i need to get my mother-in-law evaluated she's on day four of symptoms we've got a five-day window for paxlovid if possible to get it so let's, let's, let me stop you keith let me, keith let me start so paxlovid is the is the pfizer triple antiviral there's also molnupiravir that isn't as effective as paxlovid but paxlovid mm -hmm. is shown to be extremely safe and extraordinarily effective and you can't get it and that is a scandal but you tell me what you found <laughs> Yes. So I was able to get her a video visit with her physician at 8 a.m. that morning. And um, right after that, she got a, a prescription for it. And then it became uh, the running the gauntlet to try to find it. So, so, so hold on. So, so the doctor said at least so this, the good news is mm -hmm. the physician mm -hmm. had the 
knowledge base to say, ah, Paxlovid is, would really help you. And I Excellent agree with you. Candidate, it was yes. perfect for her. Paxlovid is exactly mm -hmm. the right thing to do. What happened? Mm -hmm. So uh, the pharmacy, of course, didn't have it. And, but we had a hint from the provider, from the physician. Um, <laughs> you, you might want to check Jackson because I heard somebody got a prescription filled out there. So three phone calls, only three phone calls later, I found the one pharmacy in Jackson that had a, where, a where, where is Jackson? Jackson what? What state? Jackson is in Amador County, about an hour away from Sacramento in the foothills. Okay. So and I, I can't. How did you find that out? That somebody somewhere it was, it was that's a crazy. Hit from the physician. I, one of my other patients managed to get it filled it, in this town. You might check there. Wow! So I did, and it paid off big. Uh, I had the the uh, prescription sent over there, and when I was when it was confirmed sent over there, I called the pharmacy. I said, "I want to make sure you you have it." Yes, I do. Yes, I have the prescription. It'll be here when you when you come and pick it up. And I did, and I brought it to her by three p.m. that day. How long, how far did you have to drive to get that done? About an hour. Oh my god! About an hour each way. I, I that was looked, nothing. I, I was prepared. I was prepared to go wherever. I was prepared hey, to go up into Oregon, yeah. Nevada, uh, San Diego. The, the fact I don't that care. you did. First of all, hats off to you. Well done. The effort was extraordinary. I myself have been. Uh, I I've not made. It was a week or two ago now that I was really searching for it. I called mm -hmm. wholesale pharmacies. I called. I called everyone. That's not going to help. And, and all I got was. California is a shit show. Good luck. Well, let me let me break it down for you. This may be very helpful to you and and your patients and anybody listening in California. Um, and every state may have its own tire fire. But um, 149 um, retail pharmacies in California appear to have been sent product so far. Mm. There's a total of 243 retail pharmacies that are listed on California. Department of Public Health's website mm. as antiviral providers. Mm. There's a total of 381 antiviral providers. I'll send you the link. Drew. Okay, thank you. Um, and the shipments seem to be increasing in the last, like last week, there were in some cases, uh, you know, a hundred courses being sent to here and there. Mostly though, it's, it seems that, um, the largest shipments are going to community health centers. They're not going to retail pharmacies. What is a community uh, health center? Uh, I'm well, let's just say anything that's not a, what looks to be obviously a retail pharmacy in my view from just the names. And I've looked up a few websites or they're, you know, free clinics, uh, uh, community based stuff. Uh, it's, it's kind of all over the map. It's kind of hard to tell. Oh and, I've, and I've just done some kind of cursory number crunching with it. But um, it seems that the most recent shipments, there's still some courses available because there's, it's interesting. There's, there's a column that says how many courses are still available as of like three, four, five days ago. Mm -hmm. Now those numbers are a little bit out of date now. Um, I passed through Stockton on my way back from a, a trip I took this weekend uh, at a couple of pharmacies that supposedly had 10 and eight left, there were zero and one left, uh, from the two retail pharmacies in that town. So you just, it's, I know, I, I, I don't, I don't understand it. And, and this is, this is what's really going to take you off. Dr. Drew. Yeah. California's COVID-19 website makes no mention of antivirals. If you search for the word Paxlovid on that website, zero results, like they never heard of it or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Whereas contrast that with Florida, their COVID-19 website highlights where to get a vaccine, how to prevent, what to do if exposed and what to do if you get sick, including monoclonals yes. with a I, treatment locator I've been saying, feature. I, I've been, oh, that's really good. I've been saying from the beginning that the public health uh, uh, push should not be isolating your house. It should be, here's what to do if you get sick. Here's where you yes. go. Here's what the treatments are. Here's how you get it. This is what a low PO2 means. I mean, really, they should be educated, just like we did with HIV. It was the same thing. Same thing we did. Now, I want to say that my my mom's physician is also my physician, my wife's physician. She's phenomenal. It's possible that she didn't mention the, um, uh, the Paxlovid because it's so hard to get and it right. might have actually put a burden yes. on my mother-in-law to get a prescription I, I, that she has such difficulty I get being that. filled. I get that. And, and so like not everybody's got a son-in-law who's like totally tuned into this and willing to drive hundreds of miles if necessary. Yeah. 
Nobody has that. Nobody has that. Nobody has that. Everybody should have that. It shouldn't have to come to that is really the point. Of course not. Um, so. I shouldn't have to have the secret knock and handshake to get this medicine <laughs> that is, you know, right. the underground. really promising. <laughs> and the time is so short. You've got five days to get her done. How did it work? Well, hard to say, right? Is it the passage of time? Is it the fact that she's vaccinated and both vaccinated and boosted? Um, and that she also got packs with it, right? It's all part of the soup. Yeah. But it's she's, a, but she's but feeling, fine. she's feeling a lot better. Yeah. That's how, that's how it's supposed to work. I, I kind of, how, how old is she again? 60, 70, 70. Yeah. I mean, she, she would, she would have had the crap kicked out of her if the packs of it hadn't been there. Did Any she ever comorbidities? Being 70. Uh, yes. Uh, asthma, uh, uh, had some, uh, clotting history. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good. I'm glad you did that. And, the, the, I, it will I'm be so more available soon. To get it done. And let's let's be clear. Was it free? Absolutely free. In fact, they, at first they asked uh, for a photocopy of her uh, insurance card, but then they said they called me back and said, it, "It turns out we don't need billings. It's all paid for." I said, "Yeah, that's what I told you." So here, here's how government the government buys all the you. product. They bought out mm -hmm. the product, and they can't get it to the patients. That's what government health care is. You like it so far? Are we digging this? The, the government like cannot crazy. do things. Like the it. government can't get shit done. Cannot. What's crazy is that according to Ugh. the list that I'm seeing of the so-called courses available, which, again, is probably several days behind, a lot of them are sitting on the shelf at these community health centers, from what I are. can tell. Of course well, they are. And, and by the way, if you're, you know, low income, whatever, you can still walk into a Rite Aid. They're not going to kick you out. Of course. You, they, you don't even need an insurance card. Like I said, you just just walk in with your prescription. If they have it, they'll fill it. They'll give it to you. Have a nice day. I don't know why there's so few shipments relative to the others going to retail pharmacies. It just seems that that is the ticket out of this. Maybe people are stockpiling or something. No. Uh, although I, I do look forward to a day when people have it in their pocket. I mean, that, that's what it's going to be. That's mm -hmm. how when this thing is really, truly endemic, we're all going to have packs of it ready to go. It's both scarce and in plentiful supply at the same time, Drew. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's just the government doing what the government does. They can't, as, as, um, Elon Musk said, he goes, it's taking an organization, it's giving giving assets and capital to organizations that do a terrible job at distributing them, a terrible job of using them and distributing them. That's, that's, that's government's function. That's how it's always worked. It will always work that way. And if you expect them to be different, but now it's it's harming people at an alarming way. It, 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 this was the same BS they did with the vaccine rollout. Do you remember when you couldn't get the vaccine? If you didn't, yes. if you didn't fit a certain something, something, you know, and then all of a sudden, oh, oh everyone's got to get the vaccine. And then they went completely the other side of the boat. It's not how medicine is practiced. This is not how it's done. This is disgusting. And it, it, that's why I wanted to play Dana White's little piece there. I thought it was so astonishing to see him to be as fitting. disgusted as anybody else. But Keith, thank you for the uh, effort and thank you for thank uh, giving you. Us I would I would be an ignoramus if I wasn't paying attention to your show and 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 your insights. Well, well done, my friend. Thank glad you so much. Somebody is. What's that, Susan? I'm glad somebody is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she likes it that somebody. Is. Thank you. <laughs> Moving you back to the audience, I'm gonna try to take a couple more calls here. Uh, did you know that was Keith's story, Susan? Yeah, I, he sent yeah. the email to me first. Yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting. And I sent it to you, and then you said, I want to get him on the show. And I said, do you want to be on the show? And he said, yes. Yeah. Uh, Stacy. I love our clubhouse. Hi, Stacy. What's up? No, let Susan finish. Okay. What's that? I'm done. Stacey? Oh, okay. No, you were in mid-conversation. Okay. All right. Hey, so my original question was for your first speaker. But now my question is, kind of a combination um like i'm a democratic socialist but i am getting so annoyed by i have to show my vaccine card to go anywhere where i am right this is and now I there's certain papers for me to work as a nurse there's mm -hmm. certain papers that i need and it's like i can't get those papers for like months yeah bureaucracy bureaucracy is it's, the enemy it, it, it's, it's the it's money the, money money but the power lines are broken <laughs> it, it, everything's broken it, it's bureaucracies are not designed to 
to render services to humans, to help humans. It's not what they do. That, that has to be done one human to one human. Somebody who's trained, somebody who's the patient's motivated and, and listening, and the, the, the caretaker right. is properly trained and properly care, caring about the, the object. And then those two, those two. Anything on top of that is a inefficiency. It's making it worse. And and I, to me, that people are just getting... Im, 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 the, the, what's going on right now because people can't get monoclonal antibodies and Paxlovid is a scandal and why it's not being reported that way, I, I don't get it. I, can I just, I know I'm taking up your time, but mm -hmm. I had no idea about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm a nurse, but I took time off once COVID started to take care of grandma who mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. And they Sorry. said she was COVID negative, but a random respiratory failure in one day. Uh oh, hold on, keep going. I'm sorry. But well, later she it like, depends who knows? on Whatever. depends on the age. I mean, that, you know, if she's in her 90s. That happens. That that's how they no, die. no, 70. That's, she was 70. But that's whatever. Weird. That's weird. Uh, uh, whatever. Yeah. It was very random. Very random. She hurt her ankle and was mm. staying with us. Anyway, my point is, I'm here on U.S. territory in the Caribbean. And I can't enter a store without showing my card. Mm -hmm. I can't even go through a drive through without wearing a mask, right. which is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, fine. I'll do that. But can we fix the schools? Can we fix the power lines that are broken? Yeah. Can yeah. we fix, can we focus on some other stuff? I'm a nurse. I understand checklists. Mm -hmm. They are important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there's a point. Someone's just trying to make money at this point. I'm not trying to be like all, oh, is it, is, it, is it money whatever. or is it is it just it, it's just I, I don't stupid know. power games you know it's people control. yeah power and control it's like control they want to impress we're gonna you. make sure we're gonna get we're gonna we'll have to wear masks and we're gonna go and and then nothing and then kids are damaged and schools are closed and mental illness and goes then off i can the say chart. hey and i could say hey we're gonna spend money in your store and they just let me in <laughs> that's a different matter that, that that's money <laughs> that, because that's, that's, i don't have a picture of my yeah. car i left it at home yeah you know like it's for nothing well that's the it's other problem so it, silly. It, it, it's well now yeah. it's a common we, cold we have too. we have great treatments we have therapeutics if they would get them out there we have good vaccines Nobody that people knows. should take advantage of them. well the fact that my profession is only slowly learning about it is astonishing to me too but i uh, uh, stacy i've got to keep getting some more Sorry. questions but okay. i appreciate yes. the call God bless very very you. much thank you for that keep doing the and, hard uh, work yeah as a nurse well no, she's taking care of moms which is even uh let's oh, see yeah yeah it's even harder oh, i'm horrible at that <laughs> i yes i will attest to that <laughs> uh joey what's going on buddy hey drew um god man just listening to your conversation really just like throws me back it's mm. just insane mm. like do you really feel that it's just like do you really feel it's just complete incompetence or is there nefarious stuff going on i think uh, it no uh, i don't think it's nefarious i, I think Inept it's I, I think it's unorganized well, there, there's an enemy in all of this and that is that is bureaucracy right and bureaucracy doesn't care. Bureaucracy isn't designed to be able to adjust course and to create nuanced opinions and to deliver healthcare. It just isn't. And so the more bureaucratic, the worse it gets. And, you know, that's it. It can't adjust course. It can't think for itself. It, it can't care about anybody or anything. It's just very sad, really, when you ask about it. And, and then the games are all sort of, the, the games are the madness of crowds. Take Just take a read this book please <laughs> and you'll be like oh my god it's like it sounds so familiar and do I, you think I remember if, last time i read this book he was under considerable heat as as being inaccurate and way off and speculative and now i'm like well uh, just look at what's going now but do you think if trump was in office that we'd have this infrastructure problem it'd I have be a different. feeling it'd be a whole have... set of different problems it would be no, a, i know but the same yeah. stuff different being, having access to medical stuff like he got all those those um, look it, it, California is in the ventilators condition. like overnight. Yeah, I know, but look, California is in the condition it is. Remember, California, if Trump had stayed president, California was not going to allow the vaccine to be rolled out. That's no, what the governor said. I understand said. that, but what so I'm trying had, to say is, if we remained just, president, we would have been the same uh, sorts of problems, just different. I just same feel stuff like they're on. not, the infrastructure is, is not keeping up with it. You know, they're just not, they're not good at what they do. Uh, right. That's right. And it's supply I mean, and demand. I like, 
Sorry. I, I like listening to Brett Weinstein and, you know, he brings in a completely different angle. He, he just really feels like, you know, if you look at the whole history of Fauci and the funding, he, he kind of like pieces it together in his mind. Like it's impossible to trust Fauci, you know, I, I, but there, he's that, looking, his, he's, this is his first encounter with the guy I've been dealing with him for 40 years. You know, I, he yeah. was mm -hmm. in, but I don't in, think Fauci, and I know like him to be, to get drugs I know him to be a good clinician, a great scientist, a good leader. He's been very, very, very good. Something happened. He, something, something happened to everybody. And it's in this zone. I'm telling you, it's in the zone of the madness of crowds. They, everybody was affected mm. by it. I, I'm trying to understand how I've been affected by it. I, I, I can't quite figure it out, but there's a, mm. and you know, and, and uh, Malone called it the, what do you call it? The delusional, what's the syndrome he called? Mass delusional psychosis. Mass psychosis. Yeah, mass yeah. delusional psychosis. We're all talking about the same thing. There's that people's thinking is all off, is disturbed. It's the decision making is off, and and it's all it's everywhere. It's 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 ubiquitous and it's weird. That that's and why that's happening. It's happened many many times in history, my friend, and it's happening now. And we need to pay attention to it because it doesn't go to good places. That's that. So it feels like there's sort of you know, uh, uh, this force is at work, but the force is, this is the vagaries of the human mind. This is the, these are the, these are the weaknesses of the human condition being played out as they have many, many times before. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've, I've managed restaurants and it's hard to get like, you know, a crew together to be on the same page and to think that's, it's like all organized it does feel, feel out, you know, outlandish to me on one hand, but then just like, to see all of this like incompetence going on just like makes me feel like geez is there or is anyone trying to like repress is it about health you know mm -hmm. and no. it just it does it does like m you know mess with my internal meter you know my intuition gets thrown off with it all you yeah. know it, it all uh, there, listen, there is go ahead i would love to give you a bottle of my hot sauce if you okay. wouldn't mind okay. sending me Sending me an address. Jo I want to get, send a, I send get a, you some. Send a note to con, right, Susan? Contact, contact at Dr. Yeah, contact at Dr. Dr. I, com. <laughs> and, uh, you can't eat hot I'm sauce. I'm not. I, I can't. I can. In my advanced age, but many of my family members can. So uh, we will get on. And I makes love his, it. Thank you, makes Joey. Makes his butt smell. It, well, more than it makes me up. Uh, right now. We I'm have having, like one side of the family that can't eat anything with spice in it. And then my side. Yeah. I think I'm going back into to uh, another... Uh, Diverticulitis episode. Oh right, no! Right now, which is awesome. From what? <laughs> what did I it's, put it's, in? It's your time. Food? It's like every four months I get it. That's just the way it goes. Oh no! Let's um, see. So here's did the you deal. Get a caraway uh, seed in there. Uh, uh, I don't know. That'll do oh, that. honey. Sometimes it just happens. <laughs> Caleb, That's my side. I know. Caleb with the, Caleb with the Crohn's disease. Yeah. That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's I one can't seed. slip a caraway in there. And nope. Uh, Crazy. Oh. All right. Well, listen, um, it's been an interesting show. Been I've really enjoyed talking with everybody. We will be back again tomorrow, correct? Let me look at my tomorrow, schedule. Tomorrow, Kelly Victory. Oh, no, I thought you were keeping that a secret. Tomorrow. Well, she's not promoting it out. So keep No, tomorrow's Kelly Victory. Yes, I know, but you were we're saying. Gonna, we're going to well, really catch up on this subject. We can talk right? about it, but right, I just have to yeah, we can talk about it. I just I'm not putting it in the title on YouTube because Yeah, we don't we don't even put so. the last name Victory. By the on way, YouTube. did you see that uh Peter Atia's uh conversation with a vaccine expert about uh vaccine hesitancy and about, you know, what the what a problem it is and what we should do about it was silenced by YouTube just for talking about vaccines, period. Mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah. I, I, I like, saw it's unbelievable. one on there and they were like, well, no, I, I was supporting, they, I was, they were presenting yeah, research was. about how it was very, very don't cause much autism about why it still killed it. Right. They don't cause autism and why people should take their vaccines. He got silenced. This yep. is disgusting, everybody. It's out of control. Remember this moment. Yeah. You don't want this to happen again. Yes, well, yes. They've, been, they've been laying off us. So I, I'm just saying that the, 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 the uh, forces are, need to really take a good look at themselves. I don't think this is how they intend to be. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. Uh, so Wednesday, we do not have a show this week, but we'll have uh, our friend Yakov Smirnov on Thursday. Oh, we got him? 
got him to Bada talk a little bada bit bada. about um, his perception uh, of what's effect. going on. Now, he's actually got a PhD, I think, now in, sci in psychology. He's a positive psychologist. He yes, he does. <laughs> and last time I interviewed him, he was very hot on the, the research he had done. Good for him. So uh, we will look at that. And I think, I believe we have uh, Heather Dubrow coming in. We got um, a fake. Hey, Caleb. Susan, Should Heather you? Dubrow coming in the, on the 25th. We do? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So, um, See, where have I been? Mm -hmm. So, um. Is there a way that we can turn his phone off? His his uh, yes, I can do that. Yeah, Susan, I can do it. It's my fault. Yeah, and Caleb, okay, Caleb okay. is instructing me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, my fault. All right. Uh, I thank love you, you honey, to, but your 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 I know radio skills. Thank are a you to off. Clubhouse. I'm going to end the room there. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Uh, Get the you. bobblehead. drdrew.com slash shop. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone being here. And we will. I've watched you all on restream. A lot of fun today out there on restream. <laughs> Um, you guys have been sort of on fire as often though, as often the case. Uh, and Susan, I wish you would, you would turned all the trolls back on for me so I can actually see what everyone's what reacting trolls? to. There's always a few lurking around and there's some good ones now. It wasn't that bad. No, no, it wasn't bad. It was, no, I'm not kidding. It was There good. was one robot, robot. And a, and a lot he, of, uh, Tom cigars nailed him. Yes. I, I see Tom's reaction to it. I don't necessarily think I get to see the, the, uh, the inciting uh, influence, <laughs> uh, but a lot of uh, a lot of love for Susan on After Dark. So <laughs> I think that's something everyone needs to uh, get those uh, ratings up, tell themselves a friend. to yeah, because it's. Uh, I think she's outdone Christina P. I think she does. We uh, we're we are doing pretty well in the comedy section on YouTube on yeah. iTunes. I haven't looked at it for a really long time, but you're you're in the top 100, honey, about that? for comedy. You're in the top 100 for comedy. That's Weird. impressive. That's not. That's a big deal. It's weird, and I'm somehow a part you're, of that. You're the you're the catalyst, as they say. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much. We will see you tomorrow, at three o'clock Pacific. I started menopause when I was in my early forties, yeah. and I was miserable for yeah. like ten years. Yeah, he would like go a week or so without sex, and he'd get this like sulky look on his face, and and I was like, oh shoot, looks like I have to have sex now. Like You're making the go. boys very happy, keep going. Oh my God, he would walk by the bed a certain way like. I was like, oh shit, he's horny. Like we gotta do something about this. <laughs> Gentlemen, any questions? I know, it was really sad. <laughs> my man. <laughs> <laughs>Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com.